Welcome to Fast Keto. I'm your host, Keto Jenna Girl. Hey guys, welcome to this week's episode of Fast Keto. Wow, today I am extremely honored to have the Maria Emmerich joining us today. She is one of the most prolific writers and contributors to the keto space, one of the first adapters to keto. And she is someone who has inspired me in so many ways over the years. When I was first starting out and more recently getting to spend some time with her in the most beautiful place in Mallorca at the Low Carb Universe event and just getting to be with her and see who she is as a person. And she is just incredibly inspiring in terms of seeking optimal health. She spends so much time giving of her time and of herself to other people to help them get off of sugar, heal their blood sugar issues, diabetes, whether it is diabetes of the ovaries and PCOS of the brain with Alzheimer's, just helping people getting their blood sugars under control, helping restore their hormone function. She does so much to help people and travels all around the world, giving of herself, giving of her time every day, getting up at the break of dawn just to be able to contribute and give back to the world. And she's just an incredibly inspiring person. This episode is one of my favorites of all the episodes of Fast Keto as well because she shared so many gems. She was dropping knowledge bombs left and right about keto and she is just one of the most experienced people when it comes to ketogenic diets and she just shared so much value today on the episode that I just had an incredible time hanging out with her over the internet (laughs) recording this episode and we had a really fun time so I could go on and on gushing about Maria but I will just get us into this episode so without further ado I hope you enjoy today's episode featuring Maria Emmerich. All right, guys, it's holiday time. And if you are looking for the perfect gift this year for your loved ones, why not give the gift of health and gaining health through low carb by gifting someone the 28 day challenge? I'm running a very, very special promotion this year. I am giving away a free membership to anyone who buys the program for a friend or family. So if you give the 28 day challenge membership and meal plan, to a friend, colleague, family member, anyone that you think would love this, I will give you an additional membership and version of the book as well. You can go to ketogenicgirl.com and use the discount code Holiday Gift Special 2018. That's Holiday Gift Special 2018. I'll put it in the show notes. And if you put two of the 20 day challenge program you can get either the digital or the digital and the book in your cart you can use the coupon code and you will get one entirely free that's savings of over 150 dollars to join the program it has unlimited membership once you join you have the full meal plans to follow for 28 days you can repeat it as many times as you like there's no time limit on the challenge and you can stay in the program and it's just a one-time upfront amount and investment in your health and there's no limit after that on staying in our group we have some members who've been in the group for two years that I'm still coaching and uh, I just love getting to do this and I love how our members also help and support all the new members that join and who are trying out keto starting keto either as a beginner or doing keto for a long time and just wanting to try something new and shake things up so that is my Christmas holiday gift special and the coupon code is holiday gift special 2018 you can put the code in at ketogenicgirl.com for a free membership to the 20 day challenge with your purchase of one for a friend family member or loved one i can't wait to have you join us 
A few disclaimers. By listening to this podcast, do you agree not to use this podcast as medical advice as I am not a qualified healthcare provider? The information presented on this podcast is for educational purposes only. Ketogenic Girl is not qualified to provide medical advice. Consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. This entire disclaimer also applies to any guests or contributors to this podcast. Prior to beginning a ketogenic diet, you should undergo a full health screening with your physician to confirm that a keto diet is suitable for you and to rule out any conditions or contraindications that may pose risks or that are incompatible with a ketogenic diet. A keto diet may or may not be appropriate for you if you have any kind of health condition, whether known to you or unknown. So you must consult your physician to find this out. Anyone under the age of 18 should consult with their physician and their parents or legal guardian. Good morning, Maria. Thank you so much for joining us this morning on Fast Keto. Thanks for being here. Oh, I'm so honored to be here. I'm so glad that we finally got to like hug and <laughs> meet. <laughs> me too. Me too. It was so cool to see you in Mallorca. I mean, how amazing was that event? Oh, oh, it was the most beautiful place. It was the most awesome event. Like if anybody goes to a low carb event that, I don't know, you must go. Yes, I wasn't it your first time on the island of Mallorca. I only went the first time in the spring. Yes, it was my first time in Spain. I guess like I grew up not really going anywhere. And so to be able to speak um, all over the world, I, I pinch myself in the morning like this is amazing. <laughs> I mean, you went to Russia and you went to Paris before I think you guys had a pretty incredible time there and then you got to go to Russia after I've just been dying to hear how that all went it was really amazing they're pretty new to keto and so they just wanted to you know learn more and it was really cool because they were just like really open-hearted I spoke and gave a presentation and then I did a cooking demo for some VIP people and one of the men went up to my husband and like your wife is so happy and he's like that's just the way she is but they just were really shocked at you know how delicious keto can be and they were really open-hearted and they thought it was funny how beautiful I thought it was because it was pretty cold but I'm used to the cold. I mean, I live in Wisconsin. That's true. I saw you were doing your morning runs there and I was like uh, just in awe that you were doing that. I I don't know if you have a, a special resistance for cold, but <laughs> that's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm alive when I'm like extra cold. I'm looking outside and there's frost everywhere. It's, it's really cold today. Well, one thing I wanted to ask you about, you really inspired me when we were in Mallorca because you were doing... You know, I mean, you're doing your morning runs and then you also doing a lot of like cold immersion in the ocean. I think you were inspiring a lot of people to try it. And then you also did cold immersion in the cold pools at the hotel. So I was wondering, is that something you've done for a while or sort of what got you interested in in kind of cold therapy and, and that? Well, yeah, for a couple of years now, I've really been into cold therapy. There's a really interesting man named Wim Hof. He's known as the Ice Man, and he can withstand freezing, you know, ice cold water for hours, and he should be like having hypothermia, and he doesn't. And what's really interesting is it really helps with your immune system. They would inject him with different viruses, and he could. When he would practice cold therapy, he would, um, you know, withstand these viruses and then they would test him when he wouldn't do cold therapy and he couldn't. But oh, wow. yeah, it really boosts your immune system. It makes me warmer throughout the day. I usually do it in the evening, though, before bedtime. So I would do the cold therapy pool in Spain after dinner. So my husband would stay with dinner and I would go up and like, it was the most beautiful pool that was like an infinity pool that looked over the ocean. But I have a cold therapy, like a bathtub outside that's just for ice cold water. I started doing it when I was training for races and it would help me um, recover faster, you know, like chilling down the muscles. What's really interesting is they're comparing this cold therapy to steroids and how much further athletes can go when their extremities are cold. Whoa. When you look at like the hands and the bottom of the feet, just like animals, you know, if you look at like a, a dog's pads of their hands and their feet, there's no hair on those spots. Mm. 
And when they're exposed to cold, you know, your recovery time is much faster. And like these athletes can do some really amazing, they have just like really amazing results. And it's almost compared to taking steroids, how much further their um, athleticism can go. Wow. That's incredible. That's really, really interesting. So do you do the breathing, his like breathing (laughs) technique? You know, I used to teach yoga. There was a time when my my husband lost his job and we were really like desperate, you know, like we lost our house and our cars. And so like I, um, I was a yoga instructor and so I started teaching yoga like various places. And so the breathing techniques was kind of something that I've always practiced. Cool. Well, most people in the keto world I know will have known your name very, very well. But if there's anyone listening out there who maybe is from a different part of the world and has never heard of Maria Emmerich, maybe you could give us just a really quick background on like how you found keto in the first place. Absolutely. When I was, I feel like this was like totally fate written in the stars. When I was 16 years old, I was, I went to the doctor because I just wasn't feeling well. And my doctor told me that I had PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. It's kind of like a diabetes that affects female fertility. But she was told that was just the cards I was dealt. There was nothing that I was doing wrong, which I kind of hate her now because, you know, I know that we know now that you can take steps to change that. But I also, she gave me an antidepressant and she gave me an acid blocker. I had IBS, like I was a mess. And this should have been when I was just this, you know, 16 year old, healthy little girl, but I was a mess. That same week, I went to the vet because my beautiful golden retriever was losing patches of her hair. And the first question the vet asked me was, what are you feeding her? And that was really eye-opening because the doctor never asked me what I was eating, but the vet connected how, you know, what I was feeding my dog was affecting her. So um, I changed my dog's diet. You know, like dogs should not be eating rice and grains. Like that's just not normal. But, it, you know, it was eye-opening. So I changed my diet to kind of what my doggy was eating, kind of like carnivore like. And I started feeling better um, because I looked into what was causing PCOS. And what PCOS is, is high androgens in a female's body. And we want some, but in excess, it can cause infertility issues. And what causes those high androgens are excess carbohydrates and caffeine. And I worked at a coffee shop. So I was like doing way too much caffeine and I was like eating way too much cereal. (laughs) And so I just like changed my diet. And I'm almost grateful I had to do it at a young age because habits are hard to break. And you know, when you're 40, my friends are like, help. And you know, if you've been having those habits for 40 years, it's hard to break them. But at 16, I just started changing everything and I I got healthier and I felt so much better. I didn't lose weight right away, but um, I like to call this the happy diet because almost immediately my moods went from a very depressed state to this happy girl that started loving life. Like I'm a totally different person. I was a shy, quiet person. And, um, People are really surprised when I say that, but I'm, you know, I I just was so different and food really changed me. Mm, Yeah, that's really amazing. And I've seen it in myself and so many people how, how incredible, what incredible effects it has on mood and mood stability. Yeah, absolutely. Since you started keto, I think you were probably one of the earliest adopters in the keto space. Are there things that you do now that are different than when you first started? Oh, absolutely. And I tell people, you know, your diet is going to look different five years from now, 10 years from now. And, you know, mine was totally different 20 years ago. And it's a good thing. Like I'm always into making a new goal each week and trying to accomplish that. Like, In college, when I would see a syllabus of everything I needed to accomplish in a semester, I'd get kind of overwhelmed and shut down. And it's kind of like that now. Like I I look at my work schedule and my travel schedule and I kind of like, oh my gosh, I got to do all of this. But if I take one day at a time, it's really manageable. And I feel really proud at the end of the day if I just do little goals each time. So if you're like me, and you just want to do baby goals, that's totally okay. And just 
maybe you look at breakfast and you change breakfast and then you look at your dinner and you change that. That's okay. Some people want to rip the bandaid off and do it all like tomorrow, which is okay. But for me, I just liked making little goals all the time and accomplishing them and like patting myself on the back. But yeah, like there's little things that we didn't know, you know, like there's so many keto people that still use flax. It's like, that is not a health food that was never meant to be eaten. You know, just like we thought soy milk was okay, you know, 20 years ago, we now know that flax is very estrogenic and we need to get away from that. So, you know, 20 years ago, I didn't know that that was a bad thing. And now, you know, I know that, you know, it's very estrogenic in men and women. Just taking a really quick break to tell you guys about the fact that if you do a new program, lifestyle change or diet change with a buddy, your success goes way up. And I'm here to be your buddy, to be your guide. If you want to try out keto or you've been doing it for a while and not getting the results that you want, you can join me in the 20 day challenge. And right now I'm running a very, very special Christmas gift special and you can go to ketogenicgirl.com use the discount code holiday gift special 2018 and you can get a two for one membership and program to the 20 day challenge that's right if you buy this as a gift for a friend or family member or colleague or anyone on your Christmas list this year I will give you a free membership as well as well as a copy of the book and you can either get just the digital version or you can buy the printed version and if you get the printed version as well I'll send you two copies and you can let me know the address to send the other one to if it's a special gift or you're giving it to them in person there's no better time to Join the 20 day challenge with January coming up. It's just around the corner and it's going to be something so fun to look forward to, to get started with keto, get started with low carb and kick off 2019 with a bang. Join the 20 day challenge. Use this discount code holiday gift special 2018. I'll put it in the show notes as well at ketogenicgirl.com. Add two of the 20 day challenge programs to your cart and use that one and you will get one completely free. I can't wait to have you join us in the new year. That's so interesting. And I wonder, you know, I mean, I know you're always learning new things because you tend to stay on the leading edge of, of things, obviously, because you're able to see keto ahead of everyone else. And, you know, seeing some of those things, what are some other things that you've learned? I mean, I know when I first started keto, all I wanted to do was trick myself into thinking I was still getting to eat all those carby foods that I loved. And I used all these different things to make, you know, those keto breads and sweet desserts and things. And as time has gone on, I mean, I made a concerted effort personally to quit sweeteners a couple of years ago, just because it was perpetuating cravings for me. But now I just really like simple mm-hmm. stuff, not spending a lot of time cooking and baking. Although I, I do love helping people find those because it's so important at the beginning to help you make the transition. But I wonder if there's sort of ways that you've adopted your diet over the years in, in that sense. Absolutely. I think in the beginning, you know, we're all looking for those replacements for rice and bread and potatoes. And, you know, your palate will change with time. And also being open to new ideas. Like I remember hearing that the first time all vegetables have anti-nutrients. And I was like, huh. And instead of shutting down and being like, you're crazy, I opened my mind up to those ideas. And same with like, I remember when someone's like, you know, all of those topical chemicals that we're using, like shampoos and conditioners and deodorant and lotions and makeup are all very, you know, estrogenic and stuff. And I was kind of like, huh, I thought they were a little crazy, but opening my mind up to, okay, maybe there's something to this and learning more like, yeah, wow, that's all really toxic stuff. But back to the food thing, you know, like thinking that fiber was a good thing. And now I know that fiber is causing more issues than like, if you think about diverticulitis, Crohn's and colitis, whenever someone has those things, the first thing the doctor tells them is cut out all the fiber. So why don't we cut it out before it becomes a menace? Right. And people will say, well, if I don't get enough fiber, 
how do I go number two? And I say, you know, newborn babies that are breastfed get no fiber and they go number two all the time. <laughs> Believe me, they do. And they're like, well, yeah, okay. Looking into how we don't need fiber, we don't need, you know, that type of vegetables and things like that. Getting back into the carnivore diet, that's when a lot of things like my husband have, has Lyme disease and how much better he feels when he does eat you know, the carnivore type diet. Yeah, not that it's a bad thing to, you know, transition from potatoes to maybe like a cauliflower, you know, mashed potato or something like that. But have we had those? Mm, probably not in like 15 years. So it's been a really long time. But like you, I do like helping people transition from one level to the next. Like, you know, mm. I do have little boys that they see TV and they see, you know, things marketed to them. Like they'll be at a birthday party and they'll see, you know, cake or whatever. And they'll say, mommy, can we make a keto cake? And I'll absolutely. Yes, I will do that. And I will make popsicle keto popsicles for them and like push pops and all of that type of stuff, because I know that their age in particular is very, you know, marketed <laughs> to have colorful mm -hmm. treats and we eat with our eyes and stuff like that. But when we dive into it, they do crave something like meatloaf versus cake anyway. But I think it's just the idea of making a cake and I still enjoy making it for them too. So it's, I don't know. Yeah, I, I totally get that. And I think so much of it is cultural and it's also just, you know, like you said, a lot of the marketing and all of that, but I sometimes think back and I don't think that I would have actually given keto a chance if I hadn't have seen that there were things like erythritol and stevia and all that, because I would have been like, oh, I just can't do that. I can't live without those things. And yet over the years, it's just been this very easy, gradual things where my palate has reset and I just really crave more of savory foods and I just want to give my body the best nutrition possible because you see how good you feel. Absolutely. It, it really is. Like I loved this diet because I could still have ice cream and, you know, something yeah. special on my birthday and it didn't feel like deprivation. You know, after a while, your palate will change. I was the pickiest eater. I remember making my best friend's mom cry when I was 15 or even younger than that. I can't remember how old I was, but I made her mom cry because I never ate her food. And my parents, they were so busy. My dad had his own plumbing business and, you know, food was kind of, you know, not, not the first thing, you know, like they forgot to make dinner. It was like, you know, cereal night. And I was like, all right, you know, I'm glad they forgot. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally get you there. And I, I think what you said about vegetables and anti-nutrients is so important. I mean, um, that just being open-minded to things and looking into them and doing your own research, I think is really important because some people, I think that the bottom line is that we've been learning through keto and low carb and all this is that there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. <laughs> And the more you delve into biochemistry and, and all this stuff, you see that there really isn't a single carb that the body no. needs you to give it from your diet because it can't make it on its own. It, there's essential amino acids and essential fats, but there's no essential carb. No, if you look at even where the nutrient density foods are, my husband did some great charts in our latest book on how you think about blueberries or kale being these really super nutrient dense foods. No, beef and beef liver, organ meat, throw all of that out of the charts, like by a lot. Mm. And so if mm. you eat, like you, you know, if you're doing carnivore, you're eating nose to tail, you get your liver on, like you are going to get those really nutrient dense foods. And I know people are like, I don't want to eat liver. Neither do I. So <laughs> what I do is this is my trick. We have a uh, food grinder. And I will tell my husband, I don't even want to know what's in there, but grind up this liver and I'm going to make, you know, chili with it or whatever. And I do like a four to one ratio, you know, ground beef to ground liver. You don't even know what's in there. It doesn't taste livery. It's really delicious. And I know that I'm getting like the super multivitamin in there, you know? Yeah. I think that's awesome. And so do you use an automatic grinder or like a hand? Oh yeah. Grinder? Um, I have, um, 
one of those KitchenAid stand mixers and you can get a grinder attachment on there. But you know, like I bow hunt and do all of that. So just using the whole animal is really important to us. And even before I was into this whole organ meat thing, like I knew that I wanted to use the whole animal and respect it and honor it. Mm. Some people think I'm cruel for bow hunting, but I think it's the most humane way to feed my family. Um, and we do honor the whole animal and we're very respectful. That's such a, a beautiful way of putting it, of honoring the animal. And, you know, we're so disconnected these days from our actual food sources. We get everything in these pretty packages and we don't really see the whole process that it goes, you know, that goes into it. Uh, it was I'd, I'd love to learn to hunt. So I'll have to come out sometime in Wisconsin. Yes, you will. You will. And what's interesting is there's something called a limiting factor. And there's so many deer in our area that if there weren't hunters, they would die of starvation or they would get hit by cars. They still get hit by cars all the time. And this is a much you know, more humane way than seeing them starve to death, which we also see here. I have to tell you this story. When I was growing up, I was living in China and I was dating this guy who lived in Australia for a little while. And so I went down to visit him and he took me on a date out in the countryside in Australia. And it was right out of a movie and it was so beautiful. And then all of a sudden I look over to the right and there's all these beautiful kangaroo and they're jumping together in unison, like coming over the hill. And all of a sudden my the guy I was dating at the time pulls a pulls the truck over, takes the shotgun out, and he just starts shooting at them. And I'm like, what is going on? And he's like, they are overrunning our entire farm. Like we have to control their population. <laughs> it was just like not the <laughs> movie experience that you think of when, you know, seeing kangaroos in the wild. But if you're a farmer, you know, they were doing what they had to do. I, I hope that he took it home though. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Oh, they definitely did. I mean, if people eat kangaroo meat and there's restaurants, I know there was one in Vancouver that used to serve kangaroo meat. And I know there's one here in, in Prague too. Um, did you actually, I just have to ask you this real quick. Did you eat any like cool things when you were in Russia? Anything? I know there's like blinis and sour cream. I know that like um, caviar is kind of a big thing there. Oh my gosh, caviar was absolutely everywhere. People asked, like, how did you eat while you were traveling, like in Paris and Spain and Russia? I would say that Paris was the, well, Spain was the easiest because they only served us keto food, right? <laughs> and if you think about, you know, an island in Spain, it's seafood. It's really, you know, it's it's fresh food. Like you don't need any rice or paella with it. It's just, it, that was easy. Um Paris was extremely easy, except for the waiters or waitresses that laughed when we said no bread, right? But that was Paris. We ate the most delicious food. It was really easy. I would say Russia was a little bit harder because of the language barrier. Um, you know, Russian is such a unique language and even their characters of, you know, the, the language is very hard to read. So that was a little bit more difficult difficult, but I had a translator with me most of the time. Um, it was such a whirlwind and it was such a work vacation that it wasn't very unique food, I would say, um, to Russia. Um, we had hamburgers and, you know, things like that, but it was really like running from one speaking event to the next. So yeah, um, that's just how that was. Yeah. Um, now I know one of the things that you recommend to people and you, you recommended it in your talk in Mallorca was maintaining salt intake and, you know, adding one to two teaspoons per day of salt and keeping a little dish, but you have to share your salt story <laughs> as well. <laughs> yeah, like what people think is, you know, like they need fiber to go number two. Actually, what happens is, you know, when you start a ketogenic diet, you get dehydrated. And that's like the first, you know, week you lose maybe five, 10 pounds, something like that. You know, that's just a lot of water retention going away, which is a good thing. But along with that water loss goes electrolytes and things like that. And you can't just drink more water, you'll just urinate out a lot more. And if you think about all the foods you eliminate, like breads and even the packaged desserts have a lot of um, sodium in there. So you have to be really aware. We're, we're used to telling people, stay away from the salt and things like that. But 
putting aside like two and a half teaspoons of salt, depending on your size, by your cooking vessel and making sure you use that every day will really help with that water retention, that low energy, and also the colon and making sure you go number two every day. But I always pack, I'm a, I'm a salt snob. I really like you know, flaky salt. It gives it a little bit of texture on my eggs and things like that. I've been in a lot of airports lately and I always, in the United States, they always want to take my salt. I don't know if it looks like, I don't know, a drug or something, but they're always like, what is this? I'm like, it's salt. Do a test. It's just salt. I swear. But in Paris, they pulled it out and I was like, it's salt. And they're like, oh yes, of course you must have your salt (laughs) because they just, they do treat you know, food, they were totally cool with me packing my own food and being a food snob in Paris because they just understand, you know, like those little tiny details of a dish really make it or break it. It's, uh, I laughed so hard when you were uh, picturing these French border guards just like, of course, <laughs> yeah, of course you travel. Of course from. you need your salt here. <laughs> Now, so you were presenting in Mallorca about oxidative priority. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. And also, I'd love to know, because I know you did kind of a little breakout session on giving people tips for, you know, cooking with their family and stuff. So I know our listeners would love to hear about that. I guess, uh, you know, I've... (sighs) I understand that all uh, all tides raise all ships, you know, and so it's nice that keto is getting more popular. I think it's been a blessing and a curse at the same time because, you know, obviously the word of keto is getting out there and it's getting more popular. However, I would say that there's a lot of bad misinformation, such as people not understanding the whole oxidative priority part of how your body goes through different fuel sources in order to tap into your own body fat. And I would say that 99% of people venture into the ketogenic diet for weight loss. I know it's like in Russia, it was for epilepsy and seizures. And I, you know, the protocol for doing keto is much different for that versus weight Mm -hmm. loss. But it is important to understand oxidative priority and how it uses different fuels in order to tap into your fat cells. And To put it into simple terms, the first thing that your body is going to break down if you actually consume alcohol, we know that that's, you know, toxic and needs, there's no storage site. And so it's going to break down alcohol first. So whether you're drinking like a carb free alcohol or not, it needs to break that down first. And it's going to hold on to everything else that you consumed. This is why alcoholics have really actually good A1Cs. Their A1Cs may be only in the fours, um, but it's not a good thing. The next thing your body's going to break down is exogenous ketones. So if you think that um, taking an exogenous ketone is going to help you with your weight loss, it's not. The third thing is protein, but protein also is going to help with your hair growth. It's going to help with the thermic effect of food. It's going to help with muscle um, maintenance. The fourth thing is carbohydrates, and then it's going to break down fat, and then you tap into body fat. And so it needs to go through all five of those before you can get to body fat. So when people think, oh, I'm going to live off of fat bombs or do fat fast, and it's okay to eat as much fat as you want, that's not true. This is, you know, they think the higher the ketone number, the better weight loss results. And that's not true. You can have really low ketones and have really great weight loss. Mine are actually quite low. And that's because I work out in a fasted state. Mm. It's not a bad thing. It's because I'm using ketones for energy. So I have less ketones in my bloodstream. But just understanding that you need to go through all five of those before you tap into body fat is really important. And each one of those have like, people are like, Oh, number three is protein. So I should keep that to a minimum. Well, that's when people start complaining that they're losing their hair, they're losing muscle loss. I living off of fat bombs or fat fast is really dangerous. Yeah. When do you think it makes sense for someone to have fat bombs? So fat fast is never, but fat bombs are like you said, in the beginning, when you have those afternoon sugar cravings or, you know, that type of stuff, then I don't mind people doing like a fat bomb to get through those cravings, you know, to get off of sugar is just fine. And it can be a savory fat bomb, you know, it doesn't have to be 
you know, like keto fudge or something. It can be, I don't, you know, mind that, but using it as a transition. But once those cravings are gone, trying to minimize those and get off those is, you know, really important to, you know, get into your, you know, really good weight loss. And that's where you might not see any weight loss in the beginning. And that's okay. Don't be so hard on yourself. Just focus on how good you feel, that type of stuff. But if you find like a seven day fat fast online, do not do that yeah. because you might see a lot of fat loss on this or um, weight loss on the scale, but you are going to lose a lot of muscle. You can't maintain your muscle on fat alone. Mm-hmm. Like you need amino acids for muscle growth, especially if you're an athlete. And then fat bombs to do long term would be more like epilepsy or seizures. We'll be back in a moment, but I just want to take a moment to say something about collagen. I received a lot of questions from you guys about collagen ever since I started posting my level up lattes where I add collagen. The only real drawback to bone broth where you get so much great collagen, it's one of the reasons that bone broth has become so popular in the last few years. You get this great collagen from it, but it's a real hassle to make. Now, for any of you who don't know, collagen is a special protein that your body uses to repair itself. Whether you're getting it to straighten out digestive problems, help your mood, soothe achy joints, repair and support your gut lining if you have leaky gut, or just get that glow back in your skin, collagen is a huge piece of the puzzle. The problem is that most of us get very little of it from our diet unless we're making bone broth around the clock. Now maybe you're using a collagen-based skin cream or you're adding collagen to your coffee like I do. That's better than getting none at all. But one of my biggest beliefs is that food beats supplements. The closer a nutrient is to nature, the easier it is for your body to break it down. That translates into superior healing. That's why I want to tell you about this bone broth from Kettle and Fire. They simmer grass-fed bones for 10 to 20 hours, extracting every drop of body-loving collagen straight from its most natural source. Their beef bone broth contains 20 grams of collagen per carton, and their chicken broth has 10. No wonder they have over 10,000 five-star reviews. The only real drawback, as I said, is making bone broth is a pain to make, but that's not going to be a problem for you because order from Kettle and Fire, they ship their broth straight to your door in specially sealed cartons. That way you can heat it up on your stove, sip it in your mug, or load up on collagen in five minutes or less. It's the next best thing to having a chef come in your house and cook it for you. Kettle and Fire has put together a very special offer for my listeners who want to experience the bone broth difference. You can go to kettleandfire.com. That's K-E-T-T-L-E and fire.com front slash ketogenic girl and use the code ketogenic girl in all caps for 15% off. The coupon code is automatically applied when you buy through this link, which I will put in the show notes. Right. And if someone is doing more of a traditional higher fat, more, you know, moderated protein diet, who do you usually, you know, with your clients, like who do you usually do that more as someone who's not looking as much for fat loss? No, I guess even my children, I would never give them that sort of diet because children need protein for growth. And what's interesting is like even a type one or type two diabetic that I work with, you know, we talk about this whole (laughs) protein turning into sugar. A steak will never turn into chocolate cake. No. (laughs) The whole gluconeogenesis is actually enabling ketosis to happen. Yeah. And... It's a whole, like I did a whole YouTube video on it if you want to watch more on it, but like children need more protein, type one, type two diabetics need more protein than they think um, because they are going through a process where they're using a lot of muscle for, you don't want to utilize your muscle tissue and burning that up and losing muscle Mm -hmm. and having muscle loss. And that's what's going on in you know, type one, type two diabetics. So they need actually a little bit more protein only in a therapeutic thing for um, epilepsy or seizures. Would I do more like a 70% fat diet, but that's not something that, you know, if you're even with cancer, we know that cancer is very smart and can grow on other things Mm -hmm. such as high ketones. So having elevated ketones for cancer is probably not a good thing either. Yeah, I find that so interesting that, you know, tumors can actually use fat and ketones for fuel in certain cases. Yeah, and that's why I believe that there's a natural process where someone going through cancer often loses their appetite. And my husband and I 
talked about this and how it's probably because they need to get into that autophagy and apoptosis where they're purging those unhealthy cells. And that only happens with long-term fasting, which I'm not, you know, a huge fan for, for weight loss, but with, you know, cancer or someone with a lot of heart disease that needs to get rid of those unhealthy cells, long-term fasting is probably the way to go. Right. And I love the point that you made about utilizing fat bombs to get off of sugar. Because I find it so amazing how many people really are desperate to know how to get off sugar addiction, how to control it. And I did this one podcast that was just with uh, Bitten Johnson. She has, she's a nurse and she just, that's all she does is focus on sugar addiction. And that stuff really does help, you know, having those, like you said, the fudge or those keto treats just to help you when those cravings hit where you're getting something that's tasty, but it's not affecting your insulin. And so you're getting off that sugar roller coaster, you know, right. and maybe well, fat will increase your insulin a little, a little right? All foods do, but I think it's the least of all the macronutrients, you know, and then just having something there so that you can, you know, especially if it's a habit or you use food, like I know I did, as a food addict, as a comfort, you know, while you're making the transition and learning other ways to kind of deal with stress and all that stuff. And it, it's so helpful to have like a nice treat and also at the holidays. So we could talk a little bit about the holidays too. And like, what are some of your tips and strategies for that? Cause I know for me, like when I'm around my family, I tend to be less mindful of like my inner dialogue and I tend to go into certain patterns and I tend to start to want things because everyone else is like indulging you know oh yeah and families are huge food pushers I'll say it's so interesting <laughs> right. people are very respectful when anybody wants to cut alcohol or cigarettes but if somebody wants to cut sugar or carbohydrates guess what your mom's gonna make you your favorite pie and try to get you to eat it <laughs> Oh, and that reminds me. So fertility. Okay. So fertility, I would do fat bombs too, because we know fat cells, this is not the time to lose weight. If you want to do keto for fertility, that's when fat bombs come into play. And I work, mm -hmm. um, I speak in New York with Dr. Kiltz is he's one of the most renowned fertility doctors in the entire world. And he even does fat injections because fat stores hold on to progesterone and you need progesterone to hold a pregnancy. Otherwise you might experience, you know, miscarriage and things like that. So fat bombs, I, I just want to mention that would be for fertility also, but yeah, like it is interesting. Like during the holidays, we have copious mm -hmm. amounts of parties and things like that. I will say my biggest trick is I will have a big meal with my whole immediate family, my Craig and the boys before we go to a holiday party, because when I go to a holiday party, it's for the social socialization. I don't know what's going to be served and I, I don't go expecting to eat and, you know, don't hang out by the food table because oftentimes we're talking a lot. You swallow before you even had a chance to chew your food. There's so many times I talk to a client, they're like, I don't even know what I ate at the party. It was a disaster <laughs> because there's just, there's food pushers and, you know, it's just, you're, you're not even chewing your food. So going there for the socialization and not the food is important. Uh yeah. That's Otherwise, really bring good. something. If it is like a, a a a dinner party or something, I always bring like deviled eggs or um, my flourless chocolate tort with people really enjoy. When I go to my parents for Christmas, it's my husband's birthday on Christmas Day, so I always make like a birthday pr pr cake for him. And uh -huh. yeah, I know, right? I bring plenty of you know, meatballs, Mama Maria's meatballs and my deviled eggs, which my kids love and plenty of things that we can enjoy. So we don't feel left out. Yeah, I think one of the big things I notice is that a lot of people receive love through the compliments that you give them about their food. And then, you know, that's why they really want you to have a slice of whatever they made. And it's, I think that's the hardest part is being able to turn things down without offending people, especially they'll be like, I made it keto. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you didn't. But I 
so appreciate the effort and there's like got to be some ways to just make people feel validated about their the time that they put in to make them feel loved and appreciated for making that stuff but I, yeah i mean um i wrote a book called keto comfort foods and i write in the beginning mm. food is love i mean we mm. and it's not it's not a bad thing to enjoy food like it's it's okay you know like I love food. I will always love food. I just like it. It's just different now. And even as a keto mom, like when my kids like my, you know, homemade keto protein noodle lasagna, like when they say, mom, this is the best lasagna ever. Like a part of me, you know, like that warms my heart. And, you know, we shouldn't, I guess we're told not to see food as a reward, but like, it's hard when my little boys were going through potty training, they asked for a kale chip when they, you know, went, you know, potty on the toilet. It's like, it's hard not to get away with that. Mm. So we're told like, you're not a dog. Don't see food as a reward. But mm. even as, you know, like this, you know, keto woman, it was hard not to get away from because, I, you know, I don't know, but I just did it differently. They don't know what an M&M is. So I didn't reward them with M&Ms or Cheerios or what other parents do. It was just keto food, right? Yeah. I think that the color makes a big difference for associations that, that are made in the brain and, and all that. Um, so I think one of the things you're really good at is making meal prep and things easy. And you're such a prolific person. I mean, you've written more keto cookbooks than anyone out there. What are some of the things that you do to save time and just be so incredibly productive? Like what's your morning routine like and, and all that? You know, like I, I will take constructive criticism to heart. Like if you, you know, the first cookbook that I wrote, the ketogenic cookbook, I, the only, you know, harsh criticism was the recipes were too hard. And at that time I didn't have children. And once I was thrown into motherhood, I, I adopted my children from Ethiopia and one was a toddler. He was two and a half. And one was a baby and the baby would cry whenever I didn't hold him. He did not have that attention. So he needed it more than probably any other baby I've ever met. And so I learned to cook with a baby strapped to my body with a baby carrier. <laughs> and my toddler would get jealous whenever I held the baby. Aww. So I had to hold his hand with the other. And so I learned to cook literally with one hand. And so understanding that cooking for most people is very difficult. They don't know, you know, the ins and outs like I was accustomed to. And so making recipes within, you know, 15 minutes was important and making it with one hand. Like I, I tried to adapt my recipes from being more difficult to very easy because I, I took that constructive criticism to heart. I wanted to make it easy for people and they don't have all day like I did to make a recipe. And so making them easier for the everyday working woman or man with children was important. And I guess prioritizing our time, we all do that. We all... You know, like, I guess when I, when you asked to do this podcast, I was like, is it audio only? Because I don't want to do my hair because I don't like yeah. <laughs> there's oftentimes like I keep my kitchen simple. I keep my closet simple. I keep everything simple now because I don't want to think about what I have to wear. I don't think, you know, I don't want to have to worry about where all my gadgets are. Everything is very simple and streamlined. And once you get to know your kitchen easier, you know, maybe it's harder or takes a little bit longer in the beginning to make keto recipes. But once those get to be in your back pocket and you know them by heart, it goes from taking 20 minutes to make the recipe to 10, you know? Right, right. Um, right. So like you said, sticking with recipes that you know and love and are simple, that really helps with, you know, cooking time. Yeah. So what are some of your go-tos, like your weekly rotation? Well, I love a hamburger, so I have a hamburger like every day. I, I really do love that. 
And gosh, like we have eggs often. There's a million different ways to do eggs. Um, I love a soft scrambled egg. <laughs> I love meatballs and meatloaf. Oh, and you. so like if I get things out to make meatloaf or meatballs, I do a quadruple batch. And I store extras in the freezer. So all I have to do is take them out and bake them. And I'll do the same thing with my protein noodle lasagna. And most people are like, oh my gosh. Like I made that for non-keto people and they didn't even know what the noodles were. Wow. And so when I make my lasagna, I'll do a quadruple batch. I'll bake one and I'll keep three of them in the freezer. And then all I have to do is put them in a delay timer and dinner is ready without me even thinking about it. And I also love, like I just did an instant pot and a slow cooker book. So the instant pot book has both instant pot directions and a slow cooker directions. So it's kind of like a two in one book, but I'm a planner. Um, I love my mom. She's fantastic, but she was a busy working mom and oftentimes didn't have dinner planned. And so I think we all learn from our parents. And with that working a lot, I will often have my children help clean up dinner while I prepare dinner for the next night. And so yeah. while they're cleaning up dinner, I will fill my slow cooker shell with everything I'm going to make. And then I put that in the fridge. And then in the morning before I talk to you, I just turn that on in the morning. Wow. That's amazing. Are you using the Instant Pot more now or still no. the slow cooker? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it depends on if you're a planner or not. Like I'm a planner. And so I don't mind the slow cooker. I love the way it makes my house smell. But I haven't used it yet. So I'm, I'm excited use some of your recipes in it yeah i mean it's it just depends on like hey if you forgot to plan you can throw ribs in your instant pot and have dinner in 20 minutes wow so or a soup in 20 minutes or whatever it is so you get home but you know it's just depends on what your preference is but uh both of them are really great tools what i love about the instant pot is oftentimes it if you have like a tiny apartment or you're living in a dorm, you can make the keto lifestyle a possibility now. Mm, yeah, that's such a good point. It's it just makes it easier to be able to do that from from anywhere. So, what are some of your favorite recipes from the new books? I like I told you I love hamburger like meatloaf stuff. So I did like a, a ranch meatloaf, and it's totally dairy free if you need to be dairy free. There's oh, wow. also like a Santa Fe meatloaf that you can do. Um, I really like, I did uh, like this Mama Maria's Italian cupcakes because I think we do eat with our eyes and they're really cute little um, savory cupcakes that my kids really adore that you can make. If you're transitioning off sweets, I did plenty of um, sweet desserts for you. I did a creme brulee in the Instant Pot. I did a flourless chocolate cupcake in the Instant Pot, which my kids really like. There's like this pumpkin pie breakfast pudding that's really delicious. I mean, oh, yeah. I had over 200 recipes and they're like, okay, we need to cut some. So <laughs> how you come up with so many. It's amazing. But I really want people to find recipes that they love. Like mm. I work really hard because I want people to see this as a lifestyle and not yes. a diet. Like people say, oh, the keto diet is so hard to maintain. No, I'm sorry, but a vegan li lifestyle would be hard to maintain. <laughs> Um, I've had people go from veganism to keto and they said they were always hungry. They had to stop and eat and like they were teachers and they had a hard time. They were always hungry and they had anxiety and all of these issues with the vegan lifestyle. What they love about keto is they can eat once a day and be plenty full and focus on work. That was the one thing I don't like to look at Amazon reviews because I'm very sensitive. <laughs> and my husband said, Oh, you got the best bad Amazon review. I said, Oh, don't tell me I'm going to cry. And he said, No, it's funny. It's good. They said, I hate this diet. I'm always full. <laughs> and that's what's so great. This is why you can get off of sugar. This is why you yeah. can get off your food addiction. This is why you can get off of bulimia and all of these things because you're finally satiated and full and you're not thinking about your next meal when you're eating breakfast. And 
you know, it's, it's very freeing and you get to eat delicious food. That's my favorite part about all this is just not being preoccupied with it because I see it so much more just as fuel. And I was a vegan for a while and it was so hard to eat. I was vegetarian for 17 years until I found keto and it changed. I mean, my health was so poor and I think I was suffering so much in that time in my health was really compromised in so many ways. And I just, I love food freedom and not thinking about it, but also so much time goes into acquiring food, prepping food, cooking food and cleaning up. And the fact that we're doing this three, four times a day, sometimes more than that is crazy. It's just way too much. It takes so much time. And I know you get a lot of food delivered too. And that, that's another great time saver. Yes, it really is. Uh, people laugh, but I have three chest freezers. Yes, I have three. But we also feed our dog <laughs> raw beef, ground up beef heart. But yeah, I get um, seafood delivered to me. I get my meat delivered to me when I, you know, but I bow hunt and all of that. So all I have to do the night before, like I said, if I'm not doing a slow cooker recipe, I'm always thinking, what am I having tomorrow? Just to make life easier. It just got to be one of my habits. And so if we're having steak, I take out steak. If we're having pork chops, I take out pork chops. So they're thawed and ready. And all you have to do is grill them on, you know, three, four minutes aside and dinner's ready within 10 minutes. And I always have sauces ready in my fridge or whatever it is to go along with it. It, like I said, we make priorities in so many areas of our life. This just needs to be one of them. But I will say that my family, my um, parents don't eat keto and they get a little triggered by if we don't eat four or five times a day um, because that is such a traditional, sad, yeah. you know, standard American of living, there's actually a funny magazine. It's kind of like a joke magazine in uh, Wisconsin called The Onion. I love The Onion. <laughs> and the front... Yes, yes, that actually is based no out way. of Wisconsin, uh, Madison. Yes. Yeah, and the front of it, this was maybe a year ago, it said, the traditional American diet now is that we eat 24 <laughs> hours a day. And it's so true. I take my kids... Well, it is. It's true. I take my kids to the zoo and kids that are my kids age, they're sitting in strollers eating, you know, Cheerios while their parents push them around the zoo. And it's like, no, they need to run around. And this is why kids may not eat your meatloaf or meatballs because they they're not hungry. They just ate yeah. a snack. But my kids eat three times a day and they're hungry for food. When I give them, if they need a snack and they're growing through a growth spurt, I would never mm -hmm. deny them food, but usually they never ask for one. Yeah. And I, I think it's so funny because that's one of the complaints that I get all the time from people. They're like, I'm not hungry anymore. I feel full all the time. And I'm like, that's a good thing, but it takes, there's an adjustment to it because, you know, it is so time consuming. And all of a sudden you have all this free time and you have to figure out how to fill that free time and you have to kind of change your life as well. You have to change your life structure when you're not spending most of the day thinking about what you're going to have or how to prepare it or prepare it or, or all that. because You're just really well nourished. And that's like you said, you know, how do you come up with all these recipes? Maybe that's like, I just have all these <laughs> free time now um, to write and create different things. And I, I really love it. I'm an introvert at heart and I'm very quiet. Nothing makes me happier than to spend the day in the kitchen with my kiddos and like just exploring food and, different ways. And, you know, I just, I don't know. I love it. Yeah. So if someone is um, so at their weight goal and they're feeling really good, they can still continue to do keto and, you know, to enhance body composition and just keep building more bone density, muscle mass, and, you know, maintaining kind of a lower, you know, body fat percentage where it's not like all the surplus fat. And what kind of, what do you recommend in that sense, like as a maintenance protocol? Well, I will just say like calories matter. If you increase your calories and uh, protein and fat enough, you will, um, you know, maintain your weight. Like some people think that you can eat as much fat as you want and eat all the butter you want and not gain weight. 
well, yeah, you will. I mean, Mm -hmm. my kids, they were underweight. I mean, my son, he was just over a year old. He looked like a newborn. He was so off the growth chart, so underweight. They're now eight and nine. They're at the 85th percentile. They're thriving. They eat basically carnivore. They eat zero carbohydrates pretty much. They enjoy that. I don't, you know, force that on them. They prefer like, (laughs) I'll do a new recipe of like pancakes or whatever. And they're like, can I just have eggs, please? (laughs) You know, because their, their, their palate is just different, you know? Um, But you can grow on a proper ketogenic diet. Children's will grow and thrive on a proper ketogenic diet where they get enough protein uh, to stimulate muscle synthesis. I will say that one of the complaints I get is like, oh, I did a, you know, I have a bioelectrical impedance scale and it says that I'm losing muscle mass on my keto diet. Well, those things, let me tell you why they're wrong and do not test your muscle mass on a bioelectrical impedance. Those are those scales that tell you how much muscle mass you have. What that does is you stand on the scale bare feet, no socks or anything, and it sends an electrical signal up and through your body. If you are dehydrated, the bioelectrical impedance will slow down and show that you lost muscle mass. That is not Mm. correct. You are just dehydrated, which we all know happens on a ketogenic diet. Even if someone has been on the keto diet for years and they didn't get enough salt the day before, it will show that they lost muscle. They did not. The scale is just showing that they have less hydration that day. Right. And it's it's a guess, guessing kind of guesswork. It is. If you really want to test it, get underwater weighing. But that's very hard unless you live maybe by a college town like I do. And they do underwater weighing. That's I went to school here in River Falls and we did underwater weighing all the time. And we would want to practice on real life people. And so if you know somebody, you know, like a professor or something, you could maybe get it done that way. That's awesome. Yeah, I've I've had a body composition scanning done like in a professional lab and it's it's not bioimpedance, it's with uh, rays, like almost like an x-ray. And I know even that is still guesswork, but I think it's it's definitely more accurate than the the impedance, which is like, you know, really not that accurate. But I, I love the idea of people going more about how they feel on their lifestyle and how good their muscle and bone mass is and you know keeping a really healthy body fat percentage how do you recommend that people sort of figure out those macros for themselves I know you touched on it a bit in your presentation you know there was kind of a protein amount that you recommended per pound yeah um I do have a free keto calculator on my blog if you don't mind saying say awesome that. okay it's at mariamindbodyhealth.com if you search Absolutely. keto calculator it's totally free Um, And I don't do advertisements on my blog because I just find them to be a bunch of marketing lies, like low carb chips and stuff. But you don't have to worry about those pop ups. Um, But uh, yeah, you just plug in what are your goals if you want to maintain, lose, or even gain some muscle, and then um, what your activity level is. And it gives you like a macro breakdown. If you focus on percentages, you will fail at the keto diet. But if you focus more on your own personal macros, that's where you'll have success. And you want to like, on average, it depends. Um, It's about 0.8 times your lean mass. If you're more active, you'd want to do more in protein. Um, And that's just enough to help maintain your muscle mass, um, keep your hair from going away. And then you use fat as a lever. If you want to lose weight, you turn the fat lever down. If you want to maintain or if it's for fertility or epilepsy, you're going to turn that fat dial up. And then play it like a game of golf. The lowest score in carbohydrates wins, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Don't think that you have to eat 20 grams or a certain amount of carbohydrates Um, And I do always suggest counting total. Don't get caught up in this fiber myth, Um, (laughs) you know, that you need like fiber for your gut health. If you eat, you know, the fiber of meat tissue, like chicken wings or ribs, you'll get enough prebiotic fiber for gut health. Yeah, the fiber doesn't just magically make the carbs (laughs) disappear. (laughs) 
I know. I don't know where that, uh, I don't know. But like I said, you know, 20 years ago, I thought fiber was a good right. thing. Right. Yeah. And it, it is amazing to be just questioning all these things and learning, you know, all these topics are so controversial and yet it makes us all kind of think things through, question things maybe adapt and, and try different things. And, and you've done such an amazing job. I'm so excited for your new books that are coming out. Uh, I have a giveaway that's on right now until December 18th for Keto Instant Pot. And tell us, you know, where we can follow the release of it and, and all of that. Yeah, I, I guess um, I'm on Instagram at Maria Emmerich. If you want to follow, like that's, you know, me there. Otherwise, I have um, a Facebook Keto Adapted or um, my blog, MariaMindBodyHealth.com. There's a lot of different giveaways going on there with the book. But um, Vanessa, like, I don't want to tear up, but you are probably the most generous. And I'm just so grateful that I got to meet you in person because you really are like, your heart is huge. And you're the most supportive keto person that I know out there. Aww. And I really want you to know that. Like, um, there's other supportive keto people, but not like you. Like, you are amazing. Uh -huh. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, um, uh, out of all the other keto bloggers, like, you are just really generous with always doing giveaways, always promoting other people. Like, I want you to... Um, be proud of that because you are a very, um, you're just really sweet. I'm really grateful I met you. In person. Oh, thank you so much. I know. I was like, it was so amazing to get to meet you in person. And I just want to thank you for all that you do. I mean, you are always giving away so much amazing information to people just to help them and spending so much of your time dedicated just to helping other people, other people's lives. I mean, flying all the way to Russia, you know, and you probably made such a huge impact there that you don't even know about. And, you know, just the number of lives that you will touch in your lifetime is amazing. <laughs> like, um, it's, it's so, so cool. You're an incredibly inspiring person. And, I really thank you even just for taking the time today to come on here and share all this knowledge with us. Thank and you. <laughs> I'm excited to see you at KetoCon in June. I think My you guys are coming. My family really enjoys the Austin. I mean, I love Austin. Um, I actually yeah. love the heat and swimming and all of that. So yeah, my whole family will be there. And I hope that you come to Low Carb Universe again. Yes. Yeah. That is just, it's such an incredible, <laughs> very special event. Um, I love KetoCon too. It's, it's a little less intimate, more overwhelming, but, um, it's still, it's, it's really, really fun. And I like to call it Disneyland for keto adults. <laughs> Cause it, it's like crazy, but a lot of fun too. Um, so yeah, it'll be super fun to, to see you guys there. I hope you guys come out and, and hang out with us in Austin and yeah, we'll be on the lookout for your book. Congratulations on releasing another one. Thank you so much. guys that was today's episode with Maria Emmerich I had such a great time podcasting with her she is such a wonderful person and she's just such a genuine adorable soul and I really love getting to know her more and just supporting what she does and if you'd like to support what she does go check out her keto calculator at her website I'll put it in the show notes but many of you probably already know it well Maria Emmerich's website. I believe it's mariamindbodyhealth.com. And be sure to check out her latest cookbook, which is Keto Instant Pot Recipes. I got an instant pot to save time and I can't wait to try out some of her recipes. So hope you get to check those two out. If you are interested in trying out my brand new higher protein meal plans, which are part of the 20 day challenge, go to ketogenicgirl.com and you can check those out right now. They are sort of part of the 20 day challenge in that you can either do them after 
having done one round of the 20 day challenge already or just start with them right out of the gate. And right now I have a two for one holiday special going on and you can use the code holiday gift special 2018. That's holiday gift special 2018. And you can buy the program for a friend, colleague, family member, someone you love who's interested in keto or low carb or someone that you think could benefit from doing a keto program and do it with them together. Have a buddy. Studies show that doing a lifestyle change with a buddy, your results are so much better. And if you don't want to buy it for anyone, I will be your buddy because I am there to help guide you, coach you, support you as you try out keto for yourself you get membership in the 20 day challenge members group as well so you can go check this out at www.ketogenicgirl.com and until the next episode i hope you have a fat-fueled rest of your day